ASTDA's highest honor is the Thomas Perrin Award, and this is presented annually to a member for long and distinguished contributions in the field of STD research and prevention. Uh, now to uh, present the Thomas Perrin Award, Dr. Hunter Hansfield. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> it's a pleasure and honor to have uh, to have this uh, responsibility. Uh, Dave Martin has been a professional colleague for many, many years, and a personal friend for all those years, but an especially close personal friend in the past several, as uh, uh, Patricia and I have uh, come to be very close and done a lot of traveling with uh, Dave and Jane. Dave Martin uh, was born in Michigan. He received the Bachelor of Arts degree with distinction in zoology at the University of uh, Kansas. In 1965, he was Phi Beta Kappa while there. He graduated cum laude from Harvard Medical School in 1969 and then did an in internship in internal medicine at uh, Bronx Hospital Einstein School of Medicine. He, he then joined, did his military service with the NIH and National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases where he was at the research unit in Panama in the Cal Canal Zone and did, uh, began his research career with, with excellent work in tropical virology and uh, there may have been some other recreational activities that, uh, <laughs> with which he became familiar as the evidence herein suggests. Um, Dave then came to uh, the University of Washington as a resident in internal medicine. He, uh, re he maintained his position with the U.S. Public Health Service, now not with the NIH, but with the U.S. Public Health Service as a uh, assigned officially to the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital, uh, which he uh, and, and also served in his residency and uh, became chief resident at the Public Health Service Hospital in 1975-76 when it was a, um, uh, when, uh, at which time that hospital was affiliated with the University of Washington. Followed that with his, infection, his fellowship in infectious diseases at the university, he was King's uh, probably fourth or fifth uh, research fellow in sequence, I believe. Uh, I have no comment on how sleepy King looks in this photo. And the uh, lady next to Dave is unrecognized by some of us at least. Um, Dave then, uh, from the University of Washington, and still reflecting his federal uh, um, affiliation, went to, became a staff physician at the New Orleans Public Health Service Hospital, where he also developed, began to develop his first uh, 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 faculty affiliation as clinical assistant professor uh, with Louisiana State University. Uh, in 1981, he formally joined the faculty on a full-time basis as assistant professor, rapidly became associate professor, and uh, for the last uh, 20 uh, uh, some years has been uh, a professor of medicine and infectious diseases, and since 1990, the chief of the section of infectious diseases at Louisiana State University School of uh, Medicine. Dave's scientific contributions are um, uh, extensive and can only be extremely uh, simplistically summarized in the time uh, available. There are four domains that Dave, in which Dave has excelled and that essentially form the uh, basis for his selection by the awards committee for the 2012 Thomas Perrin Award. Uh, the first domain is in the general area of chlamydial infections, diagnosis, epidemiology, and prevention. As, as Dave describes it, while in tropical medicine, while, while doing tropical medicine in, the, in Panama, he'd become interested in tropical viral diseases, and he expected to be a virologist. Uh, and uh, when he began talking to King about his fellowship, he was told he's pretty interested in viruses, but he was also told there was this fellow named Corey who'd come along who was sort of uh, uh, latched on to the biggie at the time, herpes, but then said something like, but chlamydia is sort of virus-like. It's a small little thing that gets in cells. 
So, uh, so why don't you work on chlamydia? Well, Dave started to do that. And, uh, and I would say that that's the, it's probably the single area for which, Dave, you are most recognized, along with the others, which have been important, because your work in chlamydia has spanned the entire 30 years uh, of your career. I've listed a couple of uh, prominent papers uh, that you wrote uh, uh, in, uh, in the field of chlamydia, chlamydia epidemiology, clinical aspects, and prevention. Um, Dave uh, became the premier investigator in uh, North America, uh, along with and soon following on the heels of Alan Ronald, when a chancroid epidemic uh, occurred in New Orleans, giving him the opportunity to learn more, publish more, and uh, expand our collective knowledge about that now rare STD to an extent that had not yet been accomplished and has not yet been surpassed. Uh, he, he updated uh, the uh, uh, diagnosis, the microbiologic diagnosis of Haemophilus decrae, both with improved culture and later working with uh, nucleic acid amplification testing. He described the clinical characteristics of genital ulcer disease it, to a greater degree than had been done uh, before. Uh, he learned that and published that azithromycin is effective therapy, and he looked at the epidemiology and transmission of that disease, in particular the strong association with crack cocaine at that time uh, in New Orleans. And a couple of his publications in that arena are listed here as well. The third domain is in that of, and really overlaps with the fourth, uh, they all overlap, of course, in Mycobacterium genitalium. After it became feasible at a laboratory level to recognize M. genitalium infections more readily through improved diagnostic means using nucleic, uh, nucleic acid amplification. Dave really was the U.S. national leader in going forward with, with uh, uh, studies to associate the syndrome with clinical syndromes, uh, understand its clinical manifestations, and to study the treatment. And most important, and a signal importance in understanding this organism, is the determinants of its persistence following uh, therapy. And again, a couple of his uh, publications are listed uh, here as well. The fourth domain relates closely to M. genitalium and really started with it, I believe, and that is uh, becoming a national maven in understanding the microbiome and microbial e ecology of the female genital tract. So studies of bacterial vaginosis along with people like Jeannie Marazzo and Sharon Hillier and David Fredericks and others uh, has been, uh, has uh, made signal contributions in the clinical manifestations and in particular has been interested in the associations of the uh, vaginal ecology with HIV risks. Other career benchmarks include um, uh, about 140 uh, peer-reviewed scientific publications, 230 or so other publications, reviews, chapters, and so on. Um, the picture in the lower right, by the way, I believe David had just told this girl why she needed HPV immunization even though she's only nine years old. Um, Dave has set a standard to be emulated uh, in training and mentorship of, uh, of other career scientists who have made signal contributions to the field, uh, at least three of whom are in attendance uh, here today, Patty Kissinger, Stephanie Taylor, and Leandro uh, Mena. Um, he provides unexcelled clinical infectious disease services at LSU and in the city of uh, New Orleans. Um, his public health leadership in both, uh, both at a community public health level and in terms of, of maintaining and reviving some important signal research capabilities and so on in New Orleans uh, in the wake of uh, Hurricane Katrina have made him, I understand, a legend uh, in the medical communities of that city. Um, Dave was president and chair of the ISSTDR and chaired the New Orleans meeting in 1995. He was de facto co-chair working with, uh, with the uh, organizers in uh, Seville in 1997 as well. He, achieved, he, he received the STD Achievement Award in 2007. A 
couple of final personal comments. Uh, Dave is known and was cited in all three of the letters that proposed his uh, nomination to the awards committee uh, for his, what I will call his quiet competence. Uh, Dave, many of us, probably most of us who won the Parent Award uh, are people who when we raise our hands to say something, there's a certain proportion will say, oh my God, what's going to come out now? <laughs> And I speak from personal experience on that. But Dave, nobody ever had that concern. Nobody ever had that concern when Dave said, I have something uh, to contribute. He has friendships galore. I would describe him as perhaps the most likable uh, of all the parent awardees of all time. <laughs> he has a marriage and a family uh, that we can all emulate. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the 2012 <laughs> recipient of the uh, American SD Association's Thomas Parent Award. Perhaps there's a secret that I'm not aware of here. Click on that. I'm, uh, oh, clicking, yes, I need to hit enter. There we go. Uh, no, hang on a second. There we go. Well, maybe. I don't know if that's it. Let's try this. So, on New Year's Day, 1979, <clears throat> my family and I decamped from the great blue state of Washington to move to the reddest of red states, Louisiana. <laughs> red defined not only politically, uh, but also by the CDC, by virtue of its high numbers of STDs. I had left Seattle, the mecca of STD research, but found myself in chlamydia nirvana. <laughs> the, the Big Easy. The Big Easy, <clears throat> long known as the Crescent City in reference to the large bend of the Mississippi River that defines the city geographically, the Appalachian Big, Big Easy gained greater usage following John Conway's novel and the movie that uh, followed the book. Generally, the term refers to our laid-back lifestyles, love of festivals, good food, and great music. As for the origin of the term, in the early 20th century, jazz musicians referred to a gig as an apple. And they re referred to a plum engagement in New York City as the Big Apple. Over time, the term became used as a nickname for the city of New York. <clears throat> in New Orleans, there were many ways and many opportunities for um, musicians to make a living. So thus, playing off the term for New York, musicians begin to refer to our city as the Big Easy. So what are some of the lessons that I've learned over the last 30 years in this most historic and culturally vibrant city in the United States? The captions are for my children when we moved. <laughs> I promised them when we moved from Seattle to the Gulf Coast that we could go to the beach every weekend. <laughs> I didn't know much about geography of the Great South at that time. Where's the beach? Well, <clears throat> the kids, there is no beach. It's two miles, it's two hours away in Mississippi. New Orleans is surrounded by swamp. <clears throat> yeah, did you say that dead people live in those little houses? 
Yes, indeed, indeed, children, they do. The water table in New Orleans is right at the surface. It is below sea level, after all. If it rains heavily, anyone buried in the ground floats to the top. <laughs> wow, Dad, this looks like a fun street. <laughs> yes, it is, kids, but you can't go there for another 15 years. <clears throat> Dad, what's an impersonator? <laughs> In the Big Easy, you learn that things are not always what they first appear to be. When we, Jane and I started going down to the quarter for Mardi Gras, I saw this lovely apparition walking down the street. It was only after walking past and taking this picture. <laughs> <clears throat> that I, I realized the anatomy strongly suggested male gender. <laughs> Your spouse starts dressing up strangely in the Big Easy, it turns out. <clears throat> Jane came back before Mardi Gras about 15 years ago and told me not to worry about getting a costume, that she had designed costumes for both of us. <clears throat> in the Big Easy, people tend to live out their fantasies through costuming. <laughs> That's me in the dog suit. <clears throat> collar and she's got the leash. <laughs> Everyone learns to have fun in New Orleans. This is me in my now famous yellow polyester suit. Only in New Orleans would you find the chief of infectious disease dressed up this way with his arm around the chairman of the department of OBGYN <laughs> wearing a tutu and black angel wings. <clears throat> So in, um, I need to thank a number of people for this great honor, the ASTDA, uh, ASTDA uh, Awards Committee. Uh, this was very unexpected on my part, and I'm humbled <coughs> by receiving this award. There are a number of people, though, that I also have to thank, the first being Carl Johnson, my mentor at the Middle America Research Unit, who guided my early efforts in research <clears throat> with arboviruses. King Holmes, of course, my fellowship mentor at the University of Washington, who taught me how to think critically, covered my early papers with red ink, thus teaching me how to write scientifically, inspired me by his enthusiasm for STD research, and has supported my career throughout. I also owe a debt to some who trained at the University of Washington and who became supportive colleagues, friends over the years, and these include the great Walter Stamm, <clears throat> Bob Jones, Bob Burnham, <clears throat> David Eschenbach, and then later uh, Ned Hook followed, followed us in our fellowship pathways. Our Madam President of the ASDDA, uh, Jeannie Marazzo, Julie Schachter, who taught me most of what I know about chlamydial infections, and Charlotte Gatos, who's been a wonderful consultant and colleague over the years. Then there's uh, Hunter <coughs> and Tom Quinn, good friends, colleagues, as well as traveling companions, and Hunter's wife, Patricia, and Tom with his wife. Oh, um, <laughs> I, well, I didn't have a good picture of Jeannie, but uh, <coughs> she's even cuter and, and uh, nicer than a koala bear. <laughs> then there are the fellows, Stephanie Taylor, who runs our STD clinic now and has continued our clinical studies with chlamydial infections. Richard DiCarlo, assistant dean at the School of Medicine who did the chancroid work with me. Leandro Mena, who did a lot of the work with me at, on <clears throat> mycoplasma genitalium and is now at Jackson, Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi. Rebecca Lillis, who's a, uh, now on the faculty and is working with me on the microbiome work. And then Patty Kissinger, who's not an infectious disease person, but someone we co-opted from HIV research and got her started doing the repeater study for chlamydia, and she's just taken the bit in her mouth and gone from there. <clears throat> I'm very proud of all these people. Then there's my fam <clears throat> family. We could never get where we are without our families. This is my son and granddog, <clears throat> Lucy, 
uh, my daughter Jennifer and son-in-law Jeff and their lively brood. And then finally there's Jane, my spouse of 42 years. Uh, <clears throat> expert in HIV clinical care, more so than I ever was, um, former board member of ASHA, and my greatest supporter, without, I, without whom I couldn't have accomplished anything. She even lets me off the leash sometimes when we go for a walk. <laughs> so Hunter's already described uh, many of the areas that I've been interested in in my career, and trying to decide what to speak to you about today. I thought about Shankroyd, fascinating organism, um, but uh, it uh, completely prevented itself. It mysteriously disappeared for reasons that we don't, we don't understand. So there wouldn't be too much to tell this audience about with respect to prevention. M. genitalium, it's not entirely clear yet as to whether or not we need to mount a expensive prevention program for mycoplasma genitalium. We need more data, so there's not much that I can say there. And the genitourinary microbiome is totally fascinating, entirely new field. It's keeping my old brain alive these days. But again, it's not clear that there's any prevention efforts that need to be associated with this particular organism. So what I've decided to do is to go back <clears throat> to my career-long interest in chlamydia. And today what I'd like to do is share my views with you on the uh, U.S. Chlamydia Prevention Program and offer some thoughts about what we might do in the future to better control this important sexually transmitted pathogen. So what I'll do today is review the principles of STI prevention, describe the status of the current screening and treatment programs in the U.S. I'm going to offer some thoughts on better approaches, and of course, no one can interrupt me while I'm up here, so that I'll get to <laughs> tell you exactly what I'm thinking. Uh, <clears throat> briefly highlight the potential need for a chlamydia vaccine, and then emphasize the importance of better sexual health education to accomplish these goals. So this is the May and Anderson formula, which many of you are familiar with, RO equals beta CD, RO being the rep reproductive rate of an infection or the incidence of infection, and over time, changes in the prevalence of infection. Beta represents the infectivity of the organism, <clears throat> C, the rate of partner change, and D, the duration of infectivity. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> using these principles then uh, to design control approaches, uh, we could decrease the rate of exposure by decreasing the rate of new sexual partner acquisition. And in fact, to some extent, that's occurred in the United States. These are data that go back to, in the yellow bar here, 1988. And you can see that in both women as well as in men, there have been steadily decreasing rates among adolescents uh, <clears throat> for those who have ever had sexual intercourse. And these are data from the National Survey of Family Growth. And I think that there, is a, there has been a significant effect of this fact, and we'll look at some of the, we'll look at gonorrhea and chlamydia in the context of this. We could decrease infectivity by increasing condom use. There's not particularly good data on this particular issue. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's something that probably did happen beginning in the 1970s, and I'll point out how that probably has affected the epidemic curve for Neisseria gonorrhea in a few minutes. And then we could decrease the average duration of infectivity in the population through increased detection and treatment, and this is the primary approach that we take to controlling STDs in the United States today. Screening programs, identifying those that are infected, getting those individuals treated, pulling them out of the pool, which decreases in the population the duration of infection. <clears throat> so just looking then at the gonorrhea rates and seeing how we apply these principles then to this very well-known curve for uh, the uh, prevalence of gonorrhea in the United States. So back here in World War II, as it always occurs with war, uh, there is an increase in sex partner exchange and the rates went up. 
And then as the war ended, troops came home, we got down to the business of rebuilding our country. Uh, these rates leveled off for a long period of time, 15 years. <clears throat> Many of us who grew up in high school in those days think of this as being the golden years in the United States. <clears throat> then what happened? Mid-1960s, the sexual revolution. I learned about the sexual revolution relatively late. Unfortunately, it passed me by. <clears throat> <laughs> or maybe fortunately is the better way of putting it. So then in the mid-1970s, the National Gonorrhea Control Program was launched. And uh, this involved uh, CDC funding culture capabilities in state health departments around the United States. So we started screening women in prenatal clinics, women in family planning clinics. All of our STD clinics uh, were providing cultures. Tracing, there was, there was partner trace, tracing at that time for um, individuals who were in contact to persons who were proven to have gonorrhea. And with the institution of that program, rates started to drop. Then there was all the publicity about herpes. And then following that shortly thereafter was HIV disease. And I think this probably had the greatest influence then on decreasing rates of sexual partners. So therefore, uh, the exchange rate or number of partners contacted were, were decreasing during this period of time. But then in the mid-1990s, rates leveled off. So things came down to an equilibrium at that point. So, so our gonorrhea screening program, uh, the duration of infectivity in the, in the population leveled off. Uh, rates of partner exchange possibly, you can't tell exactly what's going on, what, where the balance is, but it's clear that in the mid-1990s, uh, mid the rates did not fall any further. Gradually following actually a little bit, but not much. Clear leveling off at that, at that time. Chlamydia at that particular point, uh, all we had for diagnosis was culture. That is in the mid-70s when we launched our control program for GC. Chlamydia is an obligate intracellular uh, organism and uh, thus requires cell cultures uh, for growth in the laboratory. So these systems are complex and therefore expensive. So while there was a lot of research that was being carried out at that time using culture in research laboratories, screening and control programs were just really not possible at that point. There was a breakthrough that occurred though in the 1980s and that was the development of the first non-culture test for chlamydia and that was the direct fluorescent uh, microscopic uh, assay using urethral and cervical secretions. Uh, this assay, um, did not involve a cold chain. It was easy to transport to the laboratory. One merely made a smear on a slide, and that slide was transported to the laboratory where under a uh, fluorescent microscope, then one would pick up the little dots here, which are the elementary bodies for chlamydia, thus making, thus making the diagnosis. So it was true, a specialized scope was needed. Uh, expert microscopist was needed, but transport was very easy. So central laboratories, could fairly rapidly produce results for chlamydia, chlamydia infections. And it was on the basis of this test then that in Region 10, that is the Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska, that the first infertility prevention pilot program or the prevention pilot program was initiated. And you can see here the rather striking results in 15 to 24 year old women in family planning clinics over that period of time. 15% down in 1995 to 5.1%. Uh, to so this was very exciting and resulted in funding of the IPP program, which many of you, if not all of you, I'm sure are very much aware. It was authorized in 1992. It was a collaborative effort between CDC and the Office of Population Affairs. It funded lab testing for chlamydia and family planning STD clinics. Initially, it was with the DFA uh, test, but at that, uh, about that time, another non-culture test become, became available, and that was a gen probe, direct gene uh, probe assay. This could be semi-automated. It was easy to do in state health department laboratories in large volumes. <clears throat> it was initially launched, as I 
<coughs> pointed out in Region 10 and then three other uh, public health regions in, in 1993. The project went nationwide in 1995. In the late 90s, then, we had some new tools that came on board. The first was azithromycin, a one gram dose. Uh, the sense at that time was that there was a lot of non-compliance with doxycycline, and Ned Hook, in fact, showed that very well with a study using electric caps that demonstrated that only about half of the patients actually took their doxycycline. And <clears throat> so it was uh, deemed a single dose of an antibiotic uh, that could be directly given, guaranteeing 100 percent compliance would be a significant help in, in uh, the eradication of chlamydia. And these are data from the study that uh, Hunter alluded to earlier, looking at both men and women for chlamydial infections, showing that azithromycin and doxycycline both had uh, microbiologic success rates of 95 percent or 95 percent or greater. And so in 1998, azithromycin was listed as a, one of the recommended treatments for chlamydial infections. The next breakthrough that occurred at that time was the advent of the nucleic acid amplification test for chlamydia and gonorrhea. <clears throat> it's based on these tests are based on enhancing the detection of target over a million fold by amplifying specific gene targets, greatly increased the sensitivity and had good specificity, and automated assay systems were available for high volume testing. <clears throat> These are data from a paper published by Julie Schachter uh, in 2005. There were nine centers involved in this study. Uh, each of the three centers compared different versions of nucleic acid amplification tests, TMA, PCR, or LCR, against culture. <clears throat> I don't want to focus on the numbers that's in this table with the exception of those that are listed in the combined group. Sensitivity of 91 percent, quite excellent, but the real breakthrough was the fact that this study and others showed that these assays could be used to detect chlamydia in urine specimens. So for the first time, we could collect a specimen, take it to the laboratory. We could take, collect a specimen without doing a pelvic examination in a woman, without doing a urethral swab in a male. The assays worked quite well with uh, clinician-collected vaginal swabs. That's a C-vag uh, column here. But again, the most exciting thing was that women co could collect their own swabs and that they were equal to the clinician collected swabs for the detection of chlamydia. So this was another specimen that we could collect in non-clinical settings for the detection of chlamydial infections. <clears throat> so that led to a significant expansion then beyond family planning clinics where women were getting pelvic exams and therefore endocervical specimens were available and STD clinics where urethral specimens were being collected to uh, <clears throat> corrections facilities. This built up over time at the last reporting, I think data from 2010, 37 states participating, 60,000 women screened, 130,000 men tested annually. Job Corps, 110 uh, sites nationwide, 15,000 women, 30,000 men tested annually. In addition, expansion of testing into general medicine clinics based on the HEDIS or healthcare effectiveness data and information set. This is a quality measure that's applied to all uh, healthcare insurance companies, providers uh, in the United States. Over 90 percent of these are subject to review for quality measures. Uh, and one of those measures then is testing young women, sexually active women, less than 90 less than uh, 25 years of age. <clears throat> These data uh, from uh, 2000 through 2008 show a gradual increase both in Medicaid clinics as well as commercial clinics. So this is very encouraging. Uh, data showed in one of the presentations yesterday for the last couple of years shows that this trend continues. continues. So we have our family IPP program and STD clinics family planning and then we've got these new venues that we've uh, incorporated into the IPP program over the last 10 years or so. Where are we? Well, these are <clears throat> the data from um, that the CDC traditionally has shown, and I chose to go back a few years because 
more uh, lately, they've truncated these uh, graphs that they show in, in the interest of brevity. <clears throat> but what you can see in the upper right-hand corner is region 10 right here. And uh, you'll remember the slide earlier showing that marked decrease down to 5.1. Uh, and then continuing on in, in this particular area, perhaps going up a little bit. But the main point of this slide is that in all the other regions, beginning in 93 and 95, that it's basically flat. This was confirmed recently by Catherine Satterwhite in this uh, paper. It was published in STD, <clears throat> adjusting for test type, patient age, and race. And basically, the conclusion of this study was that in the IPP program, family planning data, the prevalence rates have been flat. <clears throat> now, perhaps <clears throat> the IPP program data is, even with the adjustments, there's a little bit of uncertainty because it's not population-based. So these are data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, <clears throat> looking at chlamydia prevalence in a representative sample with the U.S. population. And I think most of you are aware of what this is about, but basically it's a well-chosen representative sample of the U.S. population Many issues, health issues of our, uh, many health issues are looked at in order to see trends uh, with respect to the health of the nation. And about 10 or 15 years ago, urine specimens were added for detection of chlamydia. So you can see over uh, two year <coughs> rolling uh, intervals that in white women, the rate of chlamydia infection has gone down significantly. And that's also true in Hispanic women but not true in the, group, in the group at greatest risk, and that is African-American, African-American women. So the health disparity with respect to chlamydial infections appears to be growing. Overall, then, if one looks at the rates in the female population, young female population in general, there's a slight decrease, but not a major decrease. <clears throat> so this is a projection that I put together then to sort of look at the issue and think about the issue of where we are right now and where we're headed. The steep part of the curve is based on the Region 6 data, but then <clears throat> coming down and then leveling off right around the mid-1990s. And so this curve is reminiscent of what we have seen with Neisseria gonorrhea, actually, <clears throat> because it was the steep the, the last of the steep decline for Neisseria gonorrhea was from 1985 through 1995. I think actually if we had had data from the other regions in the United States with respect to chlamydia, I think we would have seen a significant decrease in those states, probably not as high as in Region 10 where they had instituted the IPP program. But still, I think there would have been a significant decrease because I can't think of any other reason why the, the, this leveling off would have occurred beginning in the, in the 1990s, and we saw no, no change in those states at all with the introduction of the IPP program. <clears throat> so given where we are right now, <clears throat> if we don't change the way we do things, this is what I think we're looking forward to with respect to chlamydia rates in the United States. So what we need is new, new screening strategies and other strategies in order to make, bring this curve closer to zero. <clears throat> I think the school-based uh, testing programs is the, the right approach here. And I'd like to just review with you a little bit of the data from New Orleans. This is a program that was started by Deborah Cohen. It was picked up by Stephanie Taylor <clears throat> later. Uh, this was the first program for looking at CTGC screening uh, in schools in, in the United States began in 1995, initially supported by an NIH grant and then by the State Health Department. Over a 10-year period, 25,000 students were tested, 7,300 were tested more than once, 2,640 2, infections were diagnosed and 83% were treated. Hurricane Katrina brought the program uh, to a close in 2005. We have attempted to revive it, but we just haven't been able to find the funding to do that. So what did we learn here? 
Well, these are data from three schools uh, that were tested consecutively over the intervals, time intervals that shown on the slide. The blue bars represent girls and and the uh, green bars represent boys. So what you can see here is that the rate over this three-year period of time in these three schools significantly decreased in boys. They went down initially in females, but then came back up, and the difference at the end, comparing the beginning and the end of the program, was not statistically significant. This was not a secular change in the community as shown in the control schools. These are five schools that were tested uh, about the end of this program, and you can see that the rate in girls and the rate in boys was about exactly the same as in the three schools when we initially started the program. So a slight decrease in females then and a significant decrease in boys. So how can we explain this? Well, maybe if we look at the data a little bit more in detail in, yes, okay, so these are data in um, the New Orleans High School is looking at the age distribution of chlamydial infections, and you can see the uh, blue line, which represents girls, and girls uh, throughout the time interval have higher rates of infection than boys do. Uh, the rates leveled off at 14%, uh, in fact, in 16 to 17-year-old girls. Infection rates in boys lag behind, but they gradually begin to catch up, and it looks like the curves are beginning to cross over at age 18 and 19. <clears throat> These data were repeated, actually, in the Philadelphia uh, High School Testing Program in a paper published just in 2006, and again, in pink, you can see the girls with significantly higher rates, boys catching up, and then at 19 and 20, crossing over. To project these data further, we'll go back to 1977 in Jeannie Marazzo's paper, a Community Survey for Chlamydial Infections in Seattle, and indeed, you can see this curve crossing over so that the peak rates are higher in the older boys. So therefore, what I think is likely to be happening is, is, since it's known that women tend to choose on the average partners that are two to three years older than they are, that this pool of older boys is actually reinfecting the younger high school girls. And that would, I think, <coughs> provide a reasonable explanation as to why it's been so difficult or why it was difficult in this program to show a substantial or significant decrease in rates in girls, whereas while the program was going on, <coughs> the rates in younger boys were steadily decreasing. Uh, <clears throat> so that suggests then that there is this uh, a target for our intervention efforts uh, need to focus on this 20 to 24 year old or 19 to 24 year old age group. And is that feasible? Uh, these are data uh, from the uh, Male Chlamydia Screening Project it was carried out in 1999 to 2003 in Baltimore, Denver, San Francisco, and Seattle. Uh, <clears throat> over 23,000 uh, men were tested. 90% of these were asymptomatic. Uh, most of them are actually detected in adult and juvenile detention programs. Only about 10% were picked up uh, outside or through street outreach, as they called it. Uh, <clears throat> The, <clears throat> you can see here that the peak uh, prevalence rate of infection, again, is in this 20 to 24-year-old age group. Uh, so the big issue, one big issue for us is to figure out how to get to this particular demographic. How do we get to these boys? Tom Gift, uh, in a recently published uh, paper, <clears throat> showed that uh, in cost, uh, cost effective an analysis that screening and treating men in a high risk environment was more cost effective than expanding current screening women from a general population. But high risk environment is the key issue. These are data from the Philadelphia, <clears throat> from the Philadelphia program uh, in which they geographically define areas at high risk. And that was just based on the IPP program, reporting cases from family planning clinics as well as STD clinics. <clears throat> so a high risk area or, or zip code was defined as being greater than 3,800 reported cases for 100,000. 
the medium risk group was 1,500 to 3,800, uh, 3, and low was less than 1,500. And so what the bars show by color, yellow being high risk, blue medium risk, and blue low risk is the rates of infection in the school kids in those districts. And not surprisingly, I guess, is that the highest rates in the high school kids were in areas that were defined as being at high risk. So the issue here would be that it would appear then that our resources need to be more efficiently focused on those areas at high risk. And so those areas at medium and high risk is probably where we should, or almost certainly I think, where we should be putting our efforts. So a plan for community-based uh, chlamydia screening and treatment. Uh, we need to focus our resources on high-risk neighborhoods. Uh, we need to have uh, school programs uh, where all of the parents and students are involved, and that's what the Philadelphia program, the New York program, uh, and our program in New Orleans. Uh, we had teams that were devoted to contacting the parents, getting the consent form back, and getting all of the kids tested. They'd be taken out of class, and they'd all be tested at more or less the same time. Now, that's unfortunately relatively expensive. <clears throat> so school population-based, if possible, but the alternative is free testing and treatment through school health clinics. So at least this is something that we could relatively easily do. Uh, we have to have parallel screening and treatment in community and adult uh, juvenile correction uh, facilities. And again, these should be targeted, I think, for the high-risk areas. I think this is a program where we need to be testing in the schools and at the same time in those communities. It's not going to work unless we can get to the males. One way of doing that is through the corrections facilities. But that's not enough. We've got to come up with some way to get to those boys that are outside the detention centers in order to get them tested as well. Very disappointing results with respect to the long-term Philadelphia school-based testing program are going to be reported tomorrow. I was greatly disappointed when I looked through the abstract book and I saw this paper and I read, I <clears throat> read the abstract book thinking that indeed it was going to show a significant decrease over time and unfortunately it did not. But I would suggest that those data need to be looked at pretty carefully. We need to see what kind of coverage we were getting in the 19 to 24 year old demographic there. I know that in Philadelphia they're testing in their corrections facilities. Uh, at least I hope they're still collecting uh, there. And <clears throat> so we need to figure out how we're going to do this. And I think one of the issues here is one of the approaches that we need to take is through the new focus on sexual health. I think sexual health education is critical for the success of any program like this. Uh, <clears throat> for this uh, to be successful, the kids uh, and young adults need to take responsibility for their own health. Uh, they have to believe that getting tested for STD is an important part of their overall wellness agenda. Only with the appropriate sexual health knowledge and belief system in place will they be likely to use school health clinics appropriately for STD screening. So we can get around that if we, if we go in and have a program where we go after all of them. But I don't think we're going to have the money to do that in the future. So at best, if we could set up programs in our schools and make sure that they have testing available, and then if we can get these kids to believe in it, then and also believe in it to the extent that they still believe in it when they're a little older, then I think that's <clears throat> we have some chance of, uh, be, of bringing chlamydia rates down in this country. So in addition to high school <clears throat> screening, there's also the possibility of home collected specimens mailed into the laboratory. And this is uh, Charlotte Gatos' uh, program, uh, I Want the Kit. <clears throat> Fascinating program that's been about 10 years in existence, or eight years in existence. They've performed about 3,300 assays. Their prevalence rate of chlamydia is higher than in family planning clinics, and the users of the system are equally divided between uh, blacks and whites. But the people that are using this program have already bought into the notion of sexual health, I think, to some degree, because they're using the program. If having a program like this, we 
I think, Charlotte, you're testing 800, 900 a year. We should be testing tens of thousands a year is what we need to do if it's going to have any influence. This program is picking up those that have already bought into the notion of sexual health, if you will. I'd like to emphasize the problem, the scope of the problem with these data, CDC funded study looking at the issue of <clears throat> looking at the issue of uh, the use of self-collected swabs versus clinic collected swabs <clears throat> to improve rescreening of women who have had a chlamydial infection. It's really two studies and one, one study was focused on STD population and the other study on the family planning population. So in the STD population, <clears throat> nearly 27 percent of the girls who were randomized to receive a self-testing kit, self-collected vaginal swab kit in the mail, returned those kits <clears throat> and were tested compared to 19 percent in the clinic group and it was a significant difference. Better in family planning, 41 percent of the home collected randomized girls were retested versus 21 percent in the clinic collected an even higher success rate. So the good news is that sending kits home to the kit, to young women indeed is better than having them come back to the clinic. But the really bad news is, look at the STD clinic, only 75% of the women did not take advantage of this program to retest themselves despite attempted reminders, telephone calls, and so on and so forth. So this is clear evidence that, to me, that <clears throat> we've got to greatly expand our sexual health education programs in this country in order to correct this sort of thing. We should have 75, 80 percent of young women offered an opportunity to retest for chlamydia given the fact that they're at a 15 percent risk of reinfection to be involved in the program. So with respect to sexual health then, this is an integrated care delivery and prevention concept that recognizes sexual expression as normative and encompasses preventive and treatment services throughout the lifespan. I highly recommend this uh, editorial or commentary by Andrea Schwarzendruber and John Zentelman, <clears throat> JAMA 2010. There will be a white paper coming out from the CDC that's going to detail a program for sexual health in general in the United States and will contain details about how we should proceed with educational programs. Uh, the Get Yourself Tested program is an early step in this direction. It's a very interesting program uh, which is uh, focused on kids and uses electronic media and uses things like Facebook, which I don't use, so <clears throat> surely it's going to be attractive to them and uh, this is a great first, uh, great first step. Uh, just before ending then today, I need to touch on uh, one other caveat though, so <clears throat> which may in a major way affect the best efforts to control chlamydia infections in the, in the United States. And these are data from Bob Brunham, uh, <clears throat> 2005, uh, where they had uh, an excellent uh, chlamydia control program in place with uh, case reporting and contact tracing and the use of azithromycin. And what they noticed in the mid-1990s was that their chlamydia rates started going up. The apparent explanation for this is shown in this slide. The blue bars represent the numbers of uh, recurrent chlamydial infections in Vancouver. And beginning in 1996, they begin to increase. The uh, <clears throat> line graph represents the reinfection, reinfection rates in a vast they attributed uh, a large percentage of their uh, rising rates of chlamydial infections to these recurrent infections in this circumstance, in, 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 in their <coughs> jurisdiction. Uh, just before ending then today, I need to touch on uh, one other caveat though, so <coughs> which may in a major way affect the best efforts to control chlamydia infections in the, in the United States. And these are data from Bob Brunham, uh, <clears throat> 2005, uh, where they had uh, an excellent uh, chlamydia control program in place with uh, case reporting and contact tracing and the use of azithromycin. 
And what they noticed in the mid-1990s was that their chlamydia rates started going up. The apparent explanation for this is shown in this slide. The blue bars represent the numbers of uh, recurrent chlamydial infections in Vancouver. And beginning in 1996, they begin to increase. The uh, <clears throat> line graph represents the reinfection, reinfection rates in a vast. They attributed uh, a large percentage of their uh, rising rates of chlamydial infections to these recurrent infections in this circumstance, in, 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 in their <clears throat> jurisdiction where they had a very good chlamydia control program. So how do we bring the May and Anderson formula into this? Well, there's only way, and that's to decrease infectivity through vaccination. So it may well be that this is our, this is our fate, that we're going to have to wait for the development of chlamydia vaccines. Fortunately, there are several companies around the United States that are working on this issue. <clears throat> and so I think it's reasonable to believe that uh, within 10 years or so, we will have a chlamydia a chlamydia vaccine in the United States, but it won't do us any good if we don't have a population that <clears throat> knows what sexually transmitted disease and chlamydia are all about, and we don't have a population that does not believe that they need to protect themselves from chlamydial infections. So in summary then, <clears throat> I think that with what we have right now and where our resources are, I, we need to take our resources, and I don't mean to gore any sacred cows, but screening that's being done by the IPP program, I think we need to think about whether some of those resources need to be redirected. And I would suggest that school-based screening um, is one way to do that along with outreach to 20 to 19 to 20 year old men in high prevalence areas. And I think that's likely to be the only way, given our current approach, that we're going to have a chance of decreasing chlamydia prevalence in this country. We need to work to ensure that the Affordable Care Act uh, funded health plans will include uh, chlamydia screening of sexually active girls less than 25 percent. I know I learned yesterday that in fact, uh, the program will pay for it, no deductibles, no co-payments, so that's a good start. But we have to get these programs invested, involved, we have to make sure that they're going to be doing, doing this. Ultimately, the success then of CT control programs, including vaccination, if and when it becomes available, will be dependent on much better sexual health education beginning at the middle school level, I think. So, <laughs> with that then, <clears throat> final lesson learned, work hard, but <clears throat> life is short. So, as we say in the big easy, les ai, les bons temps relay. <laughs> Thank you. Jeannie just told me that we, I, I got, got finished in good time and there would be time for questions. Uh, I was hoping that no, nobody would be able to take pot shots at me. <laughs> but in fact, it, this is an important issue and so if there are a few people that would like to ask questions or goad me, go ahead. Dave, it's Patty Kissinger. Um, thank you so much for a fabulous talk, so funny, so great. And I just want to mention expedited partner treatment. Don't forget that as a... Um, had this role in chlamydia. You got me started in this business and on the EPT, so I hope you are interested in that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Patty. Any other comments or questions or challenges? Can we do this? I think we can. Oh, there is. No, that's he's, he wants to take a picture. Okay. Thanks, David. All right. Thanks, David. That was great.